Hi everyone. So my name is Alexi, and uh, today we will be talking about R. So I would assume some kind of uh, knowledge of R for today. It doesn't have to be very deep knowledge, but um, it, it would be helpful if uh, you program before in R. Now, if you haven't, it's all right. Uh, the concepts that I'm going to discuss today are kind of applicable to other languages and the, the terminology is similar. So it's perfectly fine if you want to just uh, stay uh, without a knowledge of R, but just to uh, listen to overall ideas. Okay, so um, first of all, I need to, of course, uh, remind you that R is an interpreted language, um, as well as Python, Bash, Perl, and uh, which it, which means that every single command command is basically run independently. Um, in sequence, and uh, the language cannot do optimization on the whole code because it simply doesn't know what's the next command uh, going to be. Uh, on the contrary, you have compiled language where the whole source code uh, of your program could be read by the compiler and translated into machine code with certain optimizations to make things very, very fast. So which means that interpreted languages are not as performant as compiled languages. That's the main uh, idea here. Nevertheless, there are ways to make R uh, faster, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So first of all, you need to know that R pretty much uses pass uh, by value uh, concept when it comes to uh, using functions. So when your function has arguments, the parameters, um, then every time you call it, R is going to make a copy of uh, an argument. Now, I believe this is applicable if you actually try to modify the value inside of the function. So um, that uh, is a question. So maybe if you don't touch the value inside of the function, it actually uh, kind of doesn't make a copy. But it's best to just assume that is it is going to make a copy, which means if you are working with very large variables and you call in your function in, in, a, in a for loop, for example, for a million times, you're making million technically uh, copies, potentially you can run out of memory. So we do get emails once in a while, usually from Python users that, you know, they get a message that Python cannot allocate 70 gigabyte uh, of memory. Uh, for some reason, although we do have much larger um, memory on our compute nodes, we have like about 200 gigabytes or something like that. So we certainly should fit in, right? But because people forget this concept that languages will make copies of the variables to protect um, the integrity of the memory, that creates this multiple copies and that eats your memory. So something to be, uh, knowledgeable of, and uh, some languages require you to manually remove uh, kind of variables that you don't use anymore. R relies on garbage collection, which is basically an automatic system that will remove variables that are kind of of no use anymore. However, because it's an interpreted language, it really doesn't know what the next command would be if you're sitting at R prompt and you type in commands one by one. Therefore, it cannot really do very much uh, and you need to manually remove variables just um, to make sure everything is uh, freed. Now we have a question uh, that's returning from the function called releases the memory. So I would assume all the variables that were created in the function would be just dismissed. And that's probably garbage collection can do very well because it's no knows function is finished. Um, when it comes to value that's being returned, I would imagine it's not being deleted because it's going to be just um, returned from the function. Now, whether it will be additional copy of that, that I can't say. But again, it all doesn't matter if you're working with small arrays. We have lots of memory available usually. I'm talking about when you have, you know, huge uh, arrays of like, you know, 100 megabytes and you just keep being, you know, keep copying back and forth that could become 
uh, problematic. But usually with the you know data frames that we're working, it's relatively small. It's not that much of a concern. It's just to be aware of that uh, because of this copying that is happening without really your knowledge, you can run out of memory and not even know why. Especially it might apply for your machine if you're working for a, uh, you know, you're working with a data set that's relatively large and uh, takes a considerable chunk of your memory on your computer, that might be a problem. My recommendation would be, first of all, if you're working with such a large data set, most likely everything is slow because it's just very large. It takes time to load, it takes time to process, uh, it takes time to maybe free your memory a little bit, but uh, what's best alternative, in my opinion, is to reduce this data set to something more manageable, just to test everything, make sure your code works fine. Of course, you have to shrink your data set um, in a proper way. You can't just, you know, truncate half of it because the values could be scattered in a different uh, part of this uh, array, so uh, this data set. So you would have to split it, um, somehow keeping the, the distribution of uh, the values that you're interested in. So you can shrink it to something more manageable, test everything and then come to, let's say, us to one of the supercomputers and uh, launch a you know, full-blown uh, calculation on a full data set and kind of not worry uh, much about the memory. So um, you can force the garbage collector uh, yourself by calling the GC command, but it really doesn't do anything. Um, again, the reason is just it doesn't know what's going to be used and what is not going to be used. So usually what... Um, you can use it for is just to check the current state of memory. Now, before I show you how to use it, let me just uh, tell you about a couple of commands that could be useful, like the ls command just displays all the current uh, variables in your workspace. This is actually handy if you ever saved your workspace, because we personally recommend not to save the workspace. Um, I'm referring to the thing that when you close in R, it will ask you, do you want to save your workspace? I personally always say no. In fact, I have an alias not to ask it all the time because it's quite annoying. Uh, but some of you have this habit of saving things. And um, after a month or two, you might have a whole bunch of variables saved there and you just assume they're always there. So if you give me your code, it might not run on my computer because I just don't have these variables. So because we kind of practice this approach of codes that could be easily transferred between different systems, uh, we prefer to make things some kind of self-contained where you can just share it easily, even with your other computer or with, with me or with your colleague, and it's still going to run perfectly fine. So ls is a good idea. Uh, it's a good command to check what's loaded. Um, like I had a situation where one of the users had like a one gigabyte saved in, uh, in the workspace, and every time they were loading R, it will take like a minute or two just to load it. And... If you work with R, you know how often you have to open and close it just for whatever reason you're doing with it. And uh, th this is, you can't work with it anymore if you have to wait two minutes for it to even start. So the best idea, of course, is delete the workspace and just keep things uh, self-contained. You can check the, the size of an object. You can remove the variable. This is very handy because if you know you have a very large, uh, some kind of array, uh, data frame that is just not going to be used anymore, you extract everything you needed. You can free the memory by using rm command. Uh, this is the command that you can just try in your uh, R prompt. Assuming, of course, you loaded a couple of variables just to test things out. It will display all the variables ordered by the um, the size of the memory that they take. So it's kind of useful if you're wondering what's going on. Uh, talking about uh, GC command, so garbage collection. Um, you can just run GC and it will give you some weird uh, representation of the memory. Now, N cells and V cells is basically numeric cells and the vector cells. They're kind of a little bit uh, aligned by 56 bytes, I believe. That's how much um, R allocates for a regular type, not a, not a container type. And uh, V cells, they, uh, they're they multiplicative of eight bytes, I believe. So anyway, uh, it's gonna show you some kind of idea of what's going on with your memory. And more interestingly is to see what's going on when you try to allocate something or you are releasing memory. So here I'm just giving you a kind of, in a glance what you can do to test things, to you know play with R and see if things work. It might be useful in your code, but mostly it's just to kind of test things out and uh, see what's going on. Um, so you can get the memory, you can create some huge object, 
um, the object size, let's say here is like two gigabytes. And uh, then you can see that indeed um, the, the memory was reserved, well, obviously uh, it didn't disappear. And uh, if I release the uh, object, I get pretty much the same memory that I had before, give or take some kind of uh, additional um, uh, memory that was uh, taken by the you know, R for what, whatever reason it needs to be uh, used for. Well, anyway, uh, it just basically means if you work with very large variables, be sure to remove them if you don't need them anymore. Okay, so this is a first approach. Uh, it's of course to look at your memory if you're running into code that is just slow. Another thing is to profile your code. And profiling is basically understanding where your code spends most of its time. Which part of the slowest? Now, <clears throat> you might have a desire to go and fix particular part of code because maybe you found something awesome on Stack Overflow and you want to implement it. Or you just read the book and you, you know, read the documentation, you found that there is a better function to do that. That's fine, but it doesn't mean that that's the bottleneck of your code. Most likely you have some kind of a loop that you are calling million of times. And um, that's the one that needs to be optimized and not maybe a, you know, print statement or something uh, that runs relatively fast and doesn't really affect overall performance. So if your code runs for 10 minutes and uh, nine minutes is spent in a particular loop, that should be your main uh, concern and not the rest of the, of the code. So there are a number of ways to uh, figure out uh, which part of the code is uh, slow, which basically how much time it takes to run a particular uh, part of your code. You can use uh, system time, which is a built-in function comes with R, or you can download a, a package called microbenchmark. Um, and if you want to test the program from the beginning to end and, and figure out what part of the code is slow, let's say you have no clue what's going on, maybe somebody gave you the code, you're just trying to understand it, then rprof is a good package uh, to, to do that. So let's look into this in detail. Let's say I have a function. It's a silly function that just does nothing pretty much, like adds some kind of values. I want to stress my CPU to do something just to kind of um, show you how to use the functions. So very simple. I have a simple function that does something, doesn't really matter what. I call system time with the argument of this function and it gives me the basic, pretty much the time um, that you will get um, when you run time command in, in the index, right? So it's very similar. Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, it's good enough, but what could happen is that maybe at the time that you run it, I don't know, your browser decided to update or you having a movie in the background. You could, your system could be doing many different things, including, you know, software updates, antivirus updates or whatever. So the number that you see when you do a one time system time check doesn't really mean that this is very accurate. Now, what's better is if you run multiple times this function and you measure some kind of statistics on the, the timing of this function. So microbenchmark is the package that can do this for you. So here, for example, I'm limiting to how many times I want to do that. By default, um, I think it does 100, but it could be adjusted if the function runs way too fast because it can just do more times within you know something more meaningful. You don't want to wait too long, of course. But if uh, overall, you know, the, the function ta runs in like milliseconds, it can run it for a thousand times instead of 10 times. Um, and it's actually going to change the, the unit of the measurements depending how fast your function runs. So here it determined it, it runs fast enough. So it's going to do it in milliseconds. And it shows some kind of statistics on how fast this thing ran over the 10 uh, repetitions. Any questions so far? Okay, so um, what I like about microbenchmark uh, package is that you can actually compare performance of uh, different functions. So very often you can come up with a function that does something, but then two days later you realize, well, you know what, I can optimize it, I can make it better. So you write another version of this function that maybe uses some kind of optimizations. And then you want to compare, well, which one is doing better? Well, very simple to do that in uh, this package. So you can just run microbenchmark function with two arguments. I believe you can run as many as you want. It's going to just compare them all. 
And uh, you can see the unit of the of the calculation here is actually nanoseconds because it's a very fast function. But surprisingly, uh, SQRT function that's uh, built in R performs much faster than raising something to the power of 0.5. Uh, not a big deal, but if you're repeating this, you know, billion of times, maybe it's worth uh, going for a faster function, right? Because it's going to save you minutes in a in a long run. So be aware of this uh, package and uh, use it if you want to squeeze a little bit more performance out of your code. Let's say somebody gave you the code and you really have no clue what's going on, uh, but it's just slow and you were told, you know what, optimize it. What can you do? Well, you can profile the whole program altogether to figure out where the program spends most of its time. So here I have a simple code that again, it, it, it's nothing serious, it just sleeps for like a very short period of time. And then I'm doing that in a loop many, many times. How do I profile it? Well, I start by specifying the rprof command with a file where the data is going to be written to. Then I'm, let's say, calling this function that does all the work. And after it's finished, I'm just calling the rprof with a null parameter to stop the profiling. After that, I will get a file called rprof.data. You can just look at it, open it in a like, text editor, that's fine. But better is to use a summary rprof function that's going to summarize everything for you. And then there will be a, um, a value there called by total that will give you a nice overview of what's going on here. So you have total time, Self time, total percentage, self percentage, which basically means how long uh, the function uh, took to complete. Also, you have cumulative time, meaning um, how long it took also for the function with all the calls inside of the function. That would be cumulative, right? So here I'm giving like a, a short uh, overview of what's going on here. So total. Percentage or time basically means all time spent uh, within the function with the calls to other functions. And self-time and self-percentage indicates uh, the time for the each function. So together, self-percentage should add up to about 100% because you will see a bunch of calls that are very short to some kind of system function that R does um, that you're not aware of, but th these are happening anyway. So give or take, it should be about 100%. Okay, so this is about profiling, just to make you aware that this um, tool exists. Uh, there are other tools, of course, you can employ, but just if you want to start uh, and you don't know where to start, this is a good place just to kind of explore things. Um, let's say you want to push your code to another level, okay? You want to make it parallel. What do you do here? Well, there are several approaches, and today, um, I would be talking about for each package. This is uh, very nice. Um, again, different packages have their own kind of benefits and some people prefer one style or another. I'm not gonna go into the differences between them, but basically if you have a for loop in your R uh, code, uh, for each package will make it very simple to parallelize your code. How will you do that? Well, first, what is a for loop, right? So let's say I have a very simple for loop that just does something silly, uh, prints some kind of numbers on the screen. Perfectly fine. How do I parallelize it? Well, before I parallelize it, I have to switch to this library from for to for each. I need to uh, load the library, and then I just need to rewrite my for loop into for each format. Now, this is still serial. Nothing really changed. The body of your for loop is not going to change. You just need to change you just need to replace the for loop with the for each construct. That's it. Um, it's not very difficult to do, um, but after you do that, you need to verify that the code still gives the right answer, right? That's the whole idea. Uh, you make the change that does not alter the results. You're still getting the correct answer. Um, but after you, oh, scroll too much. After you verify that your code uh, still works fine, serially, everything is as it was before, now you're ready to activate the parallelism. And you can do this um, quite simply. You just uh, load the library do parallel, for example. There's also alternatively do MPI, but this is a, a whole different thing you have to uh, dive into. Let's just talk about, about do parallel. You need to register a some kind of background, uh, sorry, uh, some kind of um, backend. 
how to um, fork the processes. Uh, let's say I go for a multi-core style forking. That's fine. You can read more about that. You can just try this code and see if it works on your computer, right? Uh, and then you start discovering what's what's better. And how do you go from a serial for each to a parallel? All you have to do is replace do with do part. That's it. So after you finish the loop, it's a good idea to stop the cluster because it's kind of generate, creating all these processes. So you need to um, free the memory uh, for the system. But um, you can see the precision happened just by adding do par instead of do. So if you realize that my code doesn't work in parallel very well, how do you go back? Well, you just change do par back to do and you back to serial code that you can test to make sure everything is all right. Um, that's why I'm presenting a for each approach uh, because it's very easy to switch back and forth. You don't have to rewrite your code to uh, you know conform to uh, an apply format in like in, in other packages, for example. Here you just most likely you have a for loop already that does something. It's what it's slow, you want to parallelize it. Here are how you can do that. You can actually uh, parallelize your code across multiple computers, which uh, is pretty awesome because you don't have to rewrite your code. All you have to do is just create a different cluster. Here, I'm just doing that on the same machine, but there are ways how to um, do this on multiple machines. So you can create a piece of cluster, let's say with three uh, processes. I registered the, the backend and my code stays the same. So I really didn't have to change anything about my code. Uh, I believe I only changed the, the number of iterations just because um, because I had more room on the slide, so I decided to fit more numbers on it, but it really doesn't matter. There is no you know, value in changing from two to three. The code really doesn't do anything useful anyway. In your situation, of course, you will have number of compute, you know, iterations in your loop mean something, right? So you're not gonna just jump from two to three. Um, but the thing is that you can jump from just your machine to a full-blown cluster very, very easily. Any questions? Okay, um, I find myself using it quite often. I say I don't wanna mess with the MPI. The, if, I, if I know R, I will just create a cluster, I will run it across multiple nodes and I will collect results. So it's it's very straightforward. Uh, you don't have, really have to learn, you know, collecting results and whatever, things done for you. Um, if you want to collect results into something as a, like a one variable, one structure, you can do that by using the comb combined um, parameter uh, for, for each. And you can specify how you want to do that. So for example, C is stands for a vector. So you create a, a vector out of all of the results for each iteration. Um, if you want to use C bind, you can do that too. You get, get I like to think C bind as column bind. So you did get columns. Um, that's fine. You get like a little data frame there. Um, well, it's probably a, a matrix, uh, but nevertheless. Uh, or you can specify a operation that you want to apply. Like for example, sum, all the numbers would be added. You can also activate a multi-combine uh, functionality, which basically means the function that you're going to use to aggregate all the iterations um, can take multiple arguments. So some can be can have multiple arguments. In fact, uh, if your function only takes, let's say, 10 arguments, can't work with 20, then you can specify, I believe it's called like max combine or something like that, where you can specify that, you know, at maximum, you can do this in, in, in batches of like 10, for example. So it's all possible. Uh, maybe it's a little too fancy because you can always just take the output from a vector and just do whatever you want with it. But if you want to be a little bit more fancy, you can let for each do the work for you. So for each is very, very cool. If you have a four style uh, loop, very easy to switch to parallel code um, to the degree that then why wouldn't you even do that? Um, it, it's too easy and you get a parallelization basically for free. Of course, assuming that your iterations are independent, or at least you took care of that somehow. Uh, because if your iterations depend on each other, then 
parallelization could be a uh, could be problematic, and you would have to take care of this um, somehow in a different way. But we're talking about generations that are just independent. Uh, then it could be easily parallelized. Okay. Um, any questions? Okay, I think we have a chat message. So snow uh, style. If you do a little bit of uh, research about parallelization in R, there are two main approaches, multi-core and snow. Uh, basically, one is it, 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 basically how R is going to create processes. So there is a fork command uh, that will create processes very, very fast. It will be very convenient, but it's not available on Windows machines. So a lot of our users still use Windows machines. It's kind of part of the course. And uh, usually it's not the way you would do it because you can test it on your computer. It will work on a Linux machine, but it's not going to work on your Windows machine. So instead, you use the snow type, which uh, you uses sockets to generate processes. Um, read more about that. It's just that if you have a Windows machine, you can only use one type. Uh, if you have a Linux machine, you can use both types, whatever is uh, faster for you, I believe. Forking is a little bit faster than um, uh, creating processes through sockets. But again, if you have a Windows machine, you really have no choice. OK, um, if what you've learned today is the first time you were introduced to parallelization in R, just try this approach. And you might not even need to know about Snow or Multicore or whatever. Just do for each, and you will be perfectly fine. OK, so let's say um, you want another approach. You want to compile your code. Why? Well, because I said so, right? I said in the beginning that compiled languages are much faster. And that is uh, true. When you work with interpreted language, it's really, really slow. So everybody loves Python, right? But Python actually is very, very slow. However, most of the time you don't notice that because, well, not every day we're running numerical computations. But if you do numerical analysis, you very fast discover there are packages that will do a much better work than you writing your for loops everywhere. Uh, and this is just a general idea. You're working with interpreted language. Don't write your for loops. Just go find a package that will do things for you much, much faster. So let's say NumPy, right? Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe not. It's a, it's a very famous package in Python that basically will do everything in C or a Fortran in a backend without you knowing anything. You will be still writing your Python code, which has awesome syntax. It's it's very simple to use, but the code would be fast, very fast, because uh, it's going to be actually using C, let's say C, um, in a back in, in a backend without you knowing it. We can do that in R as well. So there is a package called called RCPP that allows you to interface with uh, C++. However, you would have to write the code yourself, right? So of course, this is for the situations where there is no uh, you know, package that does it for you. You have your custom code. You figured out there is a bottleneck right here, right? There is no solution that already can, uh, you can use it to substitute your code to make it fast, not well known at least. So you figure out you have to solve it yourself. What do you do? Well, you can actually write C code, C++ code in your R, which is pretty cool. Now, the code would be much faster. Um, it's not the same as compiling, actually. Well, no, that's not true. Um, it, it's going to be as fast as, as compiling C++. Uh, it's just that you don't have to think of everything before and after this particular part of your code. That, why? Because you will be writing in R. So you're actually writing in R, and then you have a specific part that you're going to write in C. If you write in C, well, you have to take care of everything before and after as well. But here, R is, I like the syntax. That's why I like R. And I'd rather write a small portion of my code in C that I would like to optimize rather than writing the whole code in C. But I could imagine uh, some of you may be experts in C++. And we all just grab whatever we know better, right? Um, and for me, it would be R, and for you, it might be C. That's perfectly fine. 
Um, so before we talk about RCPP, which is probably the last resort, because if you are not a big fan of C, C++ or you don't have enough lot of experience in that, it's probably not the first thing you're going to grab. There is a way to compile your code in R without touching any language that you might not know. And in fact, R does it for you without telling you. Um, in relatively new R's, and we are right now sitting, I think, at 4.3 version. So it's it's been several years since loops in R automatically byte compiled uh, for you on their first uh, use. So you write the for loop. First time it's painfully slow, but then it will be fast because R will realize that, oh, you're going to reuse this function or reuse this code. I'm going to compile it for you. Now you can actually compile it yourself on the first run because you know you're going to repeat it millions of times. So why even uh, let R decide? You can just do it uh, yourself. Uh, I'm going to show you the code, how to do that. And I'm also going to turn off the just-in-time compiler. Now, what is this just-in-time business? Uh, JIT or just-in-time compiler is a compiler that's going to compile your code into bytecode that it is it is very fast, but it's not C++, C level fast. It's it's very close, uh, but it's not a hardware language. Uh, it's not a, you know, the language that you can just um, run on uh, hardware. You still need your R and on the environment. So you didn't really have to think much about it. I would say if you're in trouble and you want to optimize your code, give it a try, see if you're getting much better results. You might be just finished right there. If if you code now 10 times faster and you're good with that, go to your next uh, project. But if not, then of course you can, uh, we, we, we can be looking into something more um, heavy like, like RCVP. So, um, Okay, I'm going to turn off the, the just in table compiler just to show you the difference between compiled performance and not compiled performance. Of course, normally you should not do that because you want to take advantage of the compiled uh, performance. But just to show you the difference, I'm going to turn it off right now. Here's the little code I have. I'm going to use the micro benchmark uh, function here, the package because I want to compare directly performance with and without compilation. I turn the just-in-time compiler off. I write some kind of function that does nothing, but it wastes time so I can see what's going on. And I also compile this function. So I have two functions. I have f function and I have lf function that is compiled version of this f function. And then I'm going to just run micro benchmark with these two functions to compare. And you can see that it's almost like 13 times difference, compiling versus not compiling. I think that should tell you that compiling is much better. And if you have code, some kind of numeric computation, you need to run it fast. You can actually compile it yourself just in case to make sure everything is compiled. So CMP fun is a great way to do that. Um, um, da -da -da -da. Yeah, that's pretty much... Um, a summary of what I just told you before. Uh, hopefully it kind of makes sense. Uh, again, this is like an overview of the tools available. Of course, there are different packages and you can find some kind of you know, third-party package that will do a better job. But again, this is probably for those who don't even know that this tool exists. They have just started learning uh, coding. And um, now you should have an overall knowledge of what is possible in R and in other languages as well. Python has uh, this kind of byte compiling too. Um, Python being a very popular language today, um, what I'm saying today could be actually applicable to Python as well. It will just have different syntax and different packages, but the same ideas. Okay, so let's say you just not satisfied with the performance of byte compiling your code. You wanna go raw, you wanna go all the way. Um, well, then RCVP is a good uh, choice to make. Uh, RCVP will require you a compiler. So it means you have to have a compiler installed in your computer. Chances are you already have it, um, especially if you're on Linux or Mac. 
or Windows, you need to download this particular uh, tools. I think it's quite large. So um, don't do this now. It's going to be a while. How do you use it? Well, this is a very simple example, right? There is, if you go down this road, you might as well just learn a little bit more about RCP and how to use it. But in case you have this, this function that you want to optimize and make it fast, maybe you want to replace a for loop or whatever you're doing. Well, here's a simple example how to run it. Um, you load the library, then you just run the CP function with the string, and this string contains your C code, right? C++ code. This is a very simple function. It really just multiplies two numbers. I don't know why would anybody write the function in C++, but just to show you that it's possible, here it is. Uh, this will create a new functions for you, function for you will call times. It will correspond to the function name in your string, the long string that uh, had the C++ code. And you can see it gives me the correct answer. Um, I'm not even comparing how fast it is because multiplication in R is already super fast. So we kind of, yeah, I'm not comparing it. It kind of would be a silly, um, it would make sense to compare on something that actually takes time, right? So, but it means you probably will have to dive into C code more and that's okay. Um, once you know R, let's say R was your first language or, or Python, you pretty know, much know 80% of other languages. Um, so you can read other codes and you can correct them and maybe you will start writing from scratch. But again, don't try to write everything from scratch because maybe there's a package that does it for you. Save yourself time, uh, save yourself aggravation uh, because once you dive into languages like C, C++, that's quite a steep learning curve, um, but it's possible. I'm not discouraging you because if you want to try it out, it's a it's a simple way to dive into um, C language. Why? Because R CPP actually provides you with data types that are compatible with R data types, like integer vector, numeric vector, and so on. It also allows you to manipulate with missing values, which is um, the hallmark of R. It doesn't crash, it just gives you an A, which is a very different behavior from other languages. And you need to know how to deal with that, but also it's an awesome part of R as well. So this is something different. And RCBP allows you to connect this benefits of very, very fast R with a very nice syntax, sorry, a very, very fast uh, C and uh, very nice syntax of R. Okay. Um, so, uh, what, let's say somebody gave you the code, what should you do? I think the first thing you should do is to profile your code. And uh, if you just write in your code or you got a half solution of something, you need to finish it first, finish it. Get to your answer. Make sure the answer is correct. Don't try to optimize something that is not even there, right? Um, I think a lot of people, including myself, we have this tendency to optimize before we even have the result. I have to stop myself and say, hold on, result is first, okay? Because I could be spending two days making my code run much faster, but I haven't even gotten to the result yet. Why am I doing that? Instead of spending two days on that, spend one day getting the result, making sure the result is correct, and then decide if it's slow, too slow for you. Because maybe just waiting one more minute on every run is, is okay. It, it's not a big deal. It's not, it wouldn't require you two days of optimizing and paralyzing your code. That, that's fine. But if you realize that it's just too slow, it takes, you know, an hour, 10 hours to run your code and you want to squeeze a little bit more, well, then, uh, of course, try following the steps I described today, like byte compiling, just in case, to make sure everything is compiled. It's super easy and uh, why not? Um, of course, RCPP is a way to go. Maybe you just find the C code, right? And you want to bring it into your uh, R code. That's also possible. Um, don't be scared of it. It's it's not very difficult, especially if maybe you have some kind of reference that you can modify. Um, but it wouldn't be particularly my first choice if I want more, more performance. And of course, uh, as we always uh, say in our um, sessions, 
is that the support is always there. It's not just during our classes or during our sessions like that, we answer your questions. Send us a, an email, ask us, um, and we will try to share our knowledge with you based on your code, right? Say, I have this code, I just, it's too slow. What can I do? Or I paralyze it and I, I get a race condition or it, it, it doesn't work. It's totally fine. Um, many of you are experts in different fields. You were not taught how to code. And uh, we would like to offer you our help, how to make your code faster. We unfortunately can't help you with the science, right? We really don't know what, what you're doing, but we know the coding part and we know how things operate. So we can help you um, put together a code that can run fast enough, performant, um, using, let's say, uh, multiple cores or multiple machines. And you do your science. We just assume you know what you're doing on your end, and we will help you what we uh, know on our, our end. Um, that's all I have for today. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, um, I thank you for joining us today. Um, and maybe Ramses wants to close this meeting, uh, but on my end, I, I'm done. Thank you for coming, and hopefully we will see each other in our um, other sessions. Thank you.